Uh, I work for IBM. I'm a maintainer in the Docker engine. I'm also a maintainer in Container D. I've been a, a contributor to uh, what was libcontainer, uh, part of the OCI and run C. Although Maroon can tell you I miss most of the meetings these days, so I'm a bad contributor over there. Uh, I am part of the Docker Captains program. Um, but just to set the stage for um, what we're going to talk about here, um, I thought I'd keep it fairly high level. I know that coming to Container D from the Docker engine and kind of that JSON REST API interface, gRPC was new to me. Um, who else is gRPC like a new thing or something you haven't done much with? All right, okay, a few hands. So hopefully this won't be incredibly boring if you already know something about gRPC. Uh, hopefully it'll give you an idea of kind of where things are going with Container D and how it's using gRPC. Um, and then if I don't get as far down in the details as you want, I think the afternoon will be a good place to, to hack around on like, you know, well, you need an API that does this and the message should include this. That's not this talk, um, but again, hopefully it'll set the framework for having those kinds of discussions later if necessary. Um, so obviously we all use some form of, of clients, maybe you know command line client that's just dealing with syscalls, kind of your LS and find on your Linux system. Um, if you've been around the cloud world for any amount of time, you've obviously interacted with sort of the rest over HTTP, model. Um, if you've used the Docker command line client, it may feel like you're actually executing commands, but that's actually using a REST API to the Docker daemon behind the covers. Or maybe, you know, just in the pure kind of web world, curl and your web browser, these are also clients to a server. gRPC is in that same kind of um, client server world, uh, but uses more of this longstanding remote procedure call uh, framework, the style of interface. Maybe you've used RPC mechanisms in a former life that you don't want to talk about. Um, well, gRPC is obviously more modern. Uh, Google put it together and uh, open sourced it. Uh, you can read a lot more about it at these uh, sites. I will post, well, the slides will be posted later if you want to dig in, into uh, anything further. But just to quote one of those sites, um, Obviously, a gRPC client is able to directly call methods on a server application on a different machine as if it was a local object. So that's the whole, obviously, intent of an RPC mechanism. So we're going to talk about kind of the basic framework of how I, I set up a gRPC um, system, like a, define a service, what are the methods on the service. If you were here, you saw Steve-O. One of his slides showed kind of a... a brief definition of a service, so we'll look at that. Um, so what are those basic important basic concepts? Um, first of all, gRPC always has a service definition. Inside that service de definition, I have RPC methods, and these RPC methods have protocol buffer defined message content, like a request and a response. So again, this is taken straight out of the gRPC um, guide, a very simple say hello. You give it a request, it returns a reply. Um, again, if you're coming from the REST, you know, JSON world, um, you know, why this new protocol buffer thing? You know, I hand code JSON all day, I'm great at it. Um, so the important thing is the protocol buffers um, serialize into a format that's much smaller, faster, simpler. Um, there's some other benefits we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, the other important piece to gRPC is this ability to now, with this um, definition, is to use a variety of languages to basically generate bindings, not just for um, the language of choice of the server, but now the client could use potentially a totally different language and use the same protocol buffers and services. Um, and we'll talk about some of the benefits of updating and even um, having backwards compatibility that's all built into gRPC. So again, you know, maybe you're thinking, why gRPC? Um, one of these benefits, again, I haven't used the term IDL, 
but an interface definition language that we're going to look at in a minute allows a compiler to basically generate uh, both the server stubs of the uh, methods that I've de defined in my IDL. The generator is going to take this .proto file and I'm going to basically allow it to uh, generate the proper language specific bindings, whether that's Go or Python or C++. Um, and so there's a huge benefit that I now get properly uh, generated bindings based on this interface that I've defined. I already mentioned the binary uh, format that's marshaled from clients to servers, uh, better performing than JSON or XML. Uh, again, correct some issues that people have had historically with those formats. Uh, in commonality, gRPC is used um, quite a few, few places you probably already know about. Uh, the Docker Swarm Kit project uses gRPC, uh, Kubernetes, etcd, uh, CoreOS, Netflix, Square, others have adopted gRPC for a lot of their uh, client server RPC models for API. Another just kind of nice benefit that's probably worth pointing out, um, again, we're not having to write uh, our client and server kind of basic implementation. We're not uh, setting up our routes. The gRPC generated code is, is providing that for us. But also the gRPC package, for, again, shown here in Go, um, we're going to spend less time kind of writing and figuring out kind of all kinds of lower layer transport options a TCP, it's already going to um, handle streaming of HTTP2. It has support for OAuth and socket options like, you know, blocking or timeouts. So again, there's just a lot of nice capabilities, again, built right into gRPC that we're not going to have to to sort of muck with ourselves. You can see here all the dial options in the gRPC uh, package uh, that you get out of the box and go. All right, so that's the, uh, the very fast moving kind of what is gRPC. Uh, maybe you already knew all that. So let's jump into how is ContainerD currently set up to use gRPC. Um, obviously, we just talked about uh, when I have um, a gRPC definition, I define services. In those services, I have RPC methods. And so here you see today that uh, if you look in in the repo, you'll find the execution, shim, and content services. Um, here's the huge caveat that um, that's what's there today, and tomorrow a PR might get merged that changes this. Uh, the content uh, service just got added uh, very recently. Um, Steve-O already talked to you about the metadata service, and then obviously the distribution service. So you'll see this um, as we finalize kind of what this looks like from an RPC uh, mechanism into container D, how this fleshes out into the actual APIs um, that, that consumers will want to rely on. Um, several people mentioned the Go 1.8 uh, plugin support. And so again, this is one of the areas that Mikhail mentioned would be pluggable. Um, so I don't know if, uh, if this will come up in Tim's talk, but potentially say I, I want a CRI gRPC interface into the internals of container D, potentially writing myself a Go 1.8 plugin with uh, the implementation of that interface would be one potential way to use a pluggable uh, gRPC service. So what does it look like here? I've shown just Again, the shim as it stands today, if you go in the repo under API services shim, shim.proto, you can see the methods that were mentioned by Michael uh, earlier. Uh, you can, I obviously, this is a, a larger file than I can show, but here's just the create request with the key pieces of information that are needed to create a container. Um, so each of the services that we just talked about and any new GRP services that will be created will have a proto file. Um, there are some common files that I haven't shown here. So under uh, the API types, there'll be common types that are used by multiple uh, of the API methods. 
And then the protobuf compiler will basically generate the appropriate language binding. Again, in container D, we're generating Go bindings uh, for this. And so I think the, uh, the make file target is make protos. It has used the Go generate tooling. Um, warning, not for the faint of heart. This is my quote of, of Steve O's commit message from last week. Um, the summary is, if you want to change the protos, go talk to Steve-O or just use this tool. Uh, there's some complexity around the include paths for the protobuf compiler and the import paths in Go. And so this tool is actually, if you look at the make file today, it's going to use this tool to make sure uh, all those align properly and you end up with the .pb.go files created out of that, which then have either the client stubs or the server-side uh, handlers, uh, which then you fill in, which we'll look at an example. Obviously, you only need to go down this path when we're actually making modifications, adding to the API, removing, changing type definitions, and then that obviously is used uh, in the client or the server implementation. All right, so let's look at an example to kind of make this uh, practical and then we can see um, what else we want to discuss. So um, the CTR binary, the little sort of test binary that you can use to talk to container D today has a list command. Um, if you look at the generated execution.pb.go in the API services execution folder, uh, here is the interface that was generated, and obviously the list command is one of those things that was generated. Um, and it looks like maybe this got cut off a little bit, but again, it auto-generated a handler. We're not setting up uh, gorilla mocks and, and pointing to our routes. That's automatically done for us. In fact, um, it even has this interceptor, which allows sort of middleware to be inserted into the process. I've cut out all that code just to show that at some point it's going to call our interface list command and that's where we can put our implementation of the actual list command. And so here, very simple, we implement this container service server dot list method to actually perform the operation. So in this case, we're actually taking the containers that this uh, execution runtime knows about we're walking over them, calling whatever our state um, command is, and then obviously munging that into the proper response that gRPC, again, has defined for us out of our IDL. So again, quite simple, the list command, fairly straightforward. On the client side, again, this is one of the nice benefits of gRPC, is that it's already generated the um, the method call for us, we are, we're not actually setting up the, we have a connection that we set up, but we're just calling containers.list and everything else is handled in the auto-generated uh, gRPC stubs that were created. So again, the list command uh, becomes quite simple. I, all I've done here is remove kind of the error paths and the actual printf of the container information. But again, very simple, we get a connection to the service, we call list, and we have our response from gRPC. All the connection and transport handling uh, was done for us. So, you know, I know there's a, a mix of sort of interested parties here. So there's several paths here, I guess, based on your interest level. Maybe you're gonna consume container D via the gRPC API. So in your case, you're more interested in the client side and also the definition of those services, whether it's going to be um, the execution service, the shim service, the future metadata store, um, your interest will be mostly around how those flesh out and how you're gonna use them from either a Go client or potentially other languages and their bindings. Uh, maybe you're gonna be helping to improve or actually define some of those core container D APIs along with the maintainers that, that uh, spoke earlier. Or, or as we have already talked about, you're gonna be adding some kind of service um, that may not be part of the core, but may be valuable to your consumption of container D. And so you're gonna write a Go 1.8 plugin and your own RPC 
uh, IDL and uh, service definition with your own methods. So those are all things we can talk about later today, um, what your plan is for using it and, and how you're uh, going to expose your uh, use model. So a quick summary, we've been over some of the gRPC benefits. Uh, that outweighs any complexity around protobufs uh, for defining and implementing the API layer. Um, there is definitely an expectation that we want to get this API right so that uh, consumers aren't trying to rely on like the CTR command or the disk command. Uh, again, a lot of that will depend on sort of feedback from the community on the use cases and, and how you expect to consume it, but hopefully the API can be defined to properly be the main entry point into consumption of container D. Um, and it's already been mentioned today, you know, this, the API, these interfaces are all um, under pretty heavy development today. Um, the expectation is, you know, we want to stabilize that leading to the release that Patrick uh, mentioned. Um, then obviously post 1.0, um, some of the versioning capabilities in gRPC will allow us to retain backwards compatibility so you can create a V2 interface. You can have an IDL with changes, but you can also basically support both a 1.0 and a 2.0 API. So again, that's another benefit of the, um, of the gRPC mechanism and having the API defined there. So that's all I put into slides because I thought, again, I didn't know um, fully, you know, the audience and, and what level of detail and what level of knowledge you had about gRPC. So hopefully that at least gives us a good baseline uh, where things are today, what's defined today, and then this afternoon in some of those breakouts, um, we can, you know, talk more uh, deeply about API definition or use case.